So with the introduction of the new 16 inch MacBook Pro, the base model looks better than ever, but is it actually good for pros? So the new base model 16 inch MacBook Pro looks like a very interesting device for one major reason. The base model MacBook Pro has always been somewhat problematic for me. The 15 inch model has never really been that well rounded in its least expensive configuration. Previous models had, you know, two gigabytes of VRAM in 2016 and 17. That was like, uh, not quite enough. And even in 2018 and 19 when the base models had four gigs of VRAM, the default graphics options were really lackluster, they weren't that powerful, and you had to step it up to the higher tier and even up to the Vega graphics if you wanted to get good performance in the graphics department. Also up until this version, the base 15-inch MacBook Pro always came with 256 gigabytes of storage, which is just not enough. Now, however, the 16-inch MacBook Pro looks a lot more promising, so let's talk about the specs of this model. So this is the bone, okay, that was, <laughs> that was supposed to open the box. So this is the least expensive version that you can configure. It comes with a 2.6 gigahertz Core i7, 16 gigabytes of RAM, it comes with Radeon Pro 5300M graphics and a half terabyte SSD. They doubled the storage on the standard configurations, 512 and a terabyte, whereas before it was 256 and 512. So that's fantastic. It essentially means that this computer is $200 cheaper because you used to have to pay 200 bucks to upgrade to 512 gigs of storage, which is like a must have thing if you're any sort of a pro. The box smells like cut baby carrots. That's the best way that I could describe it. So it is a little bit thicker, a little bit bigger in terms of footprint and a little bit heavier than the previous 15 inch models. Mm. What we have here is evidence that Apple can actually listen to their customers. They've ditched the butterfly keyboard, fantastic. Much better graphics options, fantastic. Thinner bezels and a larger display, fantastic. However, what I wanna know is, is Use this- English as the main language. Press the return. No. So what I wanna know with this video is, is this base model actually good as a pro notebook? Now, this thing costs $2,400 if you buy it from Apple. However, there are numerous ways already, even though it's only been out for a few days, to get this thing for less. If you're a student, you can get it for $2,250 from Apple with the student discount. You can also... I know! <laughs> you can also find this thing on Amazon and Best Buy. A bunch of sites are already discounting it by about $100. Tentatively, we're gonna call this thing $2,200 to $2,400 and evaluate it on that basis. But I also wanna evaluate this thing, given that most people aren't going to be upgrading from the 2019 MacBook Pro. Most people that are actually looking to buy one of these new computers are probably coming from something a little bit older. And that's why, if you remember, if you watch this channel, I warned you guys back in May, I made a video about it, about why you shouldn't buy the 2019 MacBook Pro. So, you were warned. So we're gonna compare this thing to a range of older used MacBooks just to give it some extra context. Oh, well now that is interesting, isn't it? So this is a pre-touch bar Retina MacBook Pro. This one's from late 2013. We'll be comparing it, don't worry. It's almost exactly the same size. So if you're coming from one of these Retinas, and a lot of people are, a lot of people that are looking at this computer are specifically looking at it because they avoided the butterfly keyboard and were holding on to their Retinas. When you're comparing those, these generations here, they're almost exactly the same size. So the increased thickness, the increased footprint, and the increased weight aren't going to be a huge deal. All right, but enough chit chat, let's talk performance. To start, I tested Geekbench 4. Now this is the same Core i7 that you'll find in the old 15 inch MacBook Pro, and predictably it scored almost exactly the same at 22,356 in the multi-core test. Where we start to see the benefits of the new thermal architecture is over in Cinebench R20. Because we're running the CPU at full load, the MacBook is forced to deal with the heat more than it is in Geekbench. When the test starts, you can see the temps start to rise into the 90 degrees Celsius range, and then the fans kick in to start cooling the device. Once again, Apple's fan curve disappointingly waits 
until the temps are in the mid-90s to even begin ramping up the fans. And even then, it won't bother trying to get it below 90C, which is frustrating. Despite that, the device is able to stay under the T-junction of 100 degrees Celsius while running at a substantial all-core boost clock of 3.5 GHz, a very strong showing. As a result of the better cooling leading to better sustained clock speeds, we do see a noticeable improvement in score compared to the 15-inch MacBook Pro with this exact same processor. Now, where things really go bananas is in graphics. And honestly, I'm really glad about that because graphics have been a weak point of the MacBook Pro for quite a while now. Unigen Heaven shows just how much better the new RDNA graphics are. Take a look at this comparison. We're creaming the Vega 20 in this test. That is absolutely nuts. The base graphics in this new MacBook are now more powerful than the highest end graphics that used to be an extra $350 on top of the higher end $2,800 model. In order to get even close to this graphics performance on the previous 15 inch, you needed to spend at least $3,150. This is fantastic news for rendering, compute tasks, animations, and yes, people who use their Macs for games. These gains are fantastic when compared to the 2019 MacBook Pro, but they're even better when compared to older retinas. I know plenty of people who were holding out with their older 2013 to 2015 retina MacBook Pros, and make no mistake, those are very capable devices, but switching to the new 16 inch is going to be massive in terms of performance gains. The Cinebench scores are pretty much double from a mid-2015 MacBook Pro, and the Unigen Heaven scores are astronomically better. We're talking about a five to six fold increase. That's massive. But what about something more practical like video editing? Well, it may not surprise you, but this entire video was edited on the 16 inch MacBook Pro, and I even used it to record the voiceover that you just heard. So when I was finished with the first 7 minutes and 44 seconds of this video, I decided to do a little bit of a test, and I copied all 85 gigabytes of the Final Cut project onto my 2018 MacBook Pro with Vega 20 graphics, as well as onto my late 2013 15 inch MacBook Pro. The test is simple. Export the 4K30 project in ProRes and measure how long each one takes. Predictably, the late 2013 was the slowest, coming in at 2 minutes and 38 seconds. The Vega 20 MacBook Pro took just a minute 38, and the 16-inch took the crown at a minute 25. It's not a huge increase in speed, but let me remind you that the Vega 20 MacBook here was $3,150 when it was new just a year ago, and we beat it with the new machine that's $750 less. In Final Cut Pro, the 16-inch MacBook is a screamer. I had no issues with the lagging or dropped frames. It was the smoothest experience I've ever had on a MacBook. When I made my video on the Vega 20 MacBook Pro a few weeks ago, I discussed how it was fine once I waited for things to render, but here I really didn't have to. The Vega 20 MacBook Pro definitely started to lag and stutter a little bit if things hadn't rendered all the way through, whereas with the 16-inch MacBook Pro, none of that. I was able to fly through a project, leaving most of it unrendered without dropping frames. So, hypothetically, if you have a late 2013 or a mid-2015 Retina MacBook Pro, is it worth upgrading to the new 16-inch if you can afford it? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Setting aside the significant performance gains when compared to older Retina MacBooks, some of the reasons why people didn't upgrade from those older machines were because the keyboards were hideously unreliable on the touch bar models, and also the thermals were so bad they were basically just buying a flat top grill. Fortunately, both of those issues have been resolved. The keyboard on the 16 inch is simply magnificent. It's the perfect combination between the tactile clicky feel of the butterfly mechanism and the reliability and larger key travel of the scissor switch. It just feels better in every single way. In fact, if I compare the new Magic Keyboard with the butterfly and the original scissor switch, I have to say the new one is the best, even better than the old Retina MacBook Pros. That's impressive. And also, fun fact, the Touch ID button is a matte finish now. It's not glossy like it was before, so it doesn't attract fingerprints. This is actually crazy, but this is the first time I've ever been able to comfortably recommend the base model 
of the larger MacBook Pro. In the past, used or new, I would advise people to stay away from base models because they just weren't as well-rounded. The older ones had integrated graphics. The newer ones had two gigabytes of VRAM for some reason, or 256 gigabyte SSDs. They just had something that I was like, no, just don't buy it. Go for the upgraded one. But that's not the case here. This is an actual pro machine. And it's so good to see Apple finally listening and putting a good value into their entry level model. So that does it for this video. And some of you are probably confused right now because in my first video on the 16 inch MacBook Pro, I had you guys guess which configuration I went for. And I bet you didn't expect me to go for the base model. And that's because I didn't. I'm actually not gonna be keeping this MacBook Pro. I'm gonna be returning it because my custom configuration is gonna take longer to ship, it hasn't arrived yet. So the challenge is still on. There are currently three people that have correctly guessed the exact configuration. And you gotta be correct down to the exact spec. Don't just say, oh, you got the i9 because there's two of those, so nice try. But anyway, if you think you know what configuration I went for, let me know down in the comments below or follow me on Twitter at Luke Miani and tweet it at me. Not entirely sure what videos I'm gonna make with it once it arrives, but there will be some and I'll shout out the people who guessed it correctly. So definitely make sure to go do those things. As usual, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, don't forget to check out my subreddit if you have any questions. And I'll also throw a link down in the description to the discounted Amazon 16 inch MacBook Pro that I talked about earlier. So with that, I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you in the next video.